Father God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your presence among us this morning. We thank you that in the testimonies and in the talking this morning, we have been aware of you being here and you're speaking to us and with us as we've wrestled with some really difficult things. Father God, as we come to look at your word now, thank you that you are here with us. Thank you that you are going to speak to us. Thank you that you are going to touch our lives as we share together. We thank you that your word is a live and living word. And we ask that it will impact us as we look at it together. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we are looking today at Ecclesiastes chapter 11. If you're not sure where Ecclesiastes is, your Bible has an index. Recommend you look it up. We're concluding a series today looking at this uh, book. Uh, It's a part of the Old Testament, as I've said each time, that many Christians don't look at. It's one of the strangest books in the Bible. But I really enjoy reading this book. And as you're going to hear as we look at today, it is so vitally relevant to our situation and circumstances. As, As we listen to the teaching in this part of the meeting, I want you to reflect on some of those testimonies, some of those things we've had shared in the first part of our meeting. Because this text speaks directly into those situations and circumstances. This book asks some really tough questions. Tough questions about life. Questions that many people would prefer not to look at. Questions that undermine confidence or trust in human wisdom, in money, in possessions, in human pleasure, or human justice. All of that is undermined by these questions here. It includes looking at how frail and fragile human life is, and therefore how important it is to seize the day, to seize the moment, to take hold of the opportunities that are there. So if you missed any of this series, the whole series is there on our website, um, including the introduction and all the parts, and today is the final part which is called The Conclusion. (laughs) Decide today. The Conclusion. Decide today. So, let's start at chapter 11 and verse 1. And we're going to the end of chapter 12 this morning. I should mention, if you're in the teaching for the first time uh, with me this morning, that uh, I ask questions when I go through. Now, some preachers ask questions, and then they tell you the answer. When I ask questions, you tell me the answer. So we're going to be doing that as we go through several times this morning. Is that okay? As I say often, I don't mind whether you think it's okay or not, because that's what we're doing this morning. So here we go. Cast your bread upon the waters, for after many days you will find it again. Give portions to seven, yes, to eight, for you do not know what disaster may come upon the land. Who likes ducks? Who likes feeding ducks? This passage has got nothing to do with feeding ducks, so I'm sorry about that. The imagery is actually drawn from commercial shipping. It's not about English duck feeding. We're probably the only nation in the world that like to take bread down to the local pond and give it to ducks. Americans do the same, do they? They probably got it from the British. Back in the time when this was written, shipping was a rather hazardous affair. Goods had to be purchased and committed to outgoing ships. And and you never knew when or even if you might make a profit. You'd put your money, you'd invest it, you would cast your bread upon the waters. 
It also meant that a person needed to make diverse investments. Now, we have a saying in English, don't we? Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Well, don't put all your bread in one bucket might be another version. You know, send it all out to see it. You know, so it's about diverse investments as well. So what has this got to do with us and the life of faith? What an awful lot. Because faith involves trust and risk. We don't have certainty in the living God. We have faith. And those two things are not the same. Yes, I know that we can trust God, that God is absolutely dependable. But there always is. Faith is about going beyond what you can see, what you can understand. As again, we had in the testimonies this morning, so very powerfully. And the life of faith is a life of adventure. The life of faith is a life of adventure. You never quite know where it's going, what's going to happen. And, and in that life of faith, God guides you, God asks of you to make investments. I, I'm not talking about, you know, 100 pounds into some stock or other. I'm talking about investments of time and energy, even of life itself, into people, into situations. God asks you of it, and, and you've got no idea what the outcome of that is going to be. You just don't know, particularly in the short term, whether there will be any positive return. I've been a Christian quite a long time. It's um, 42, no, 45, 45 years now. Uh, 45 years, two weeks ago, I gave my life to Jesus. And over those 45 years, God has asked me to do some things that at times have seemed a bit strange, a bit odd, and quite often a bit risky. And you you never know. God asks you to to give your life, give your energy to something, and you you never know how that's going to turn out. That's part of the adventure, (laughs) but it's also part of the risk. And it's about trusting God. Now, you see it right at the beginning of the Old Testament, don't you? Well, not right at the beginning, but Abraham. God said to Abraham, uh, this is the David Wise paraphrase of the Old Testament. God said to Abraham, um, it's time to go on a journey. Where am I going? I'm not telling you. How will I know when I get there? Uh, You'll just know. How long is it going to take? Well, we're not having that conversation right now. So who's going? Well, you and your family. Which direction? Well, we'll start that way. It's a bit like how it is with us. We use the word journey about the Christian faith. We use the word pilgrimage sometimes as well. We, we never quite know where it's going to take us. And the investments of time and energy never quite know what the return's going to be. Elsewhere in Ecclesiastes, the, the writer uses the, the image of bread to stand for Something that's filled with joy, for joy-filled provision, for, for sustenance. And that links here into the image also of sharing hospitality. One of the core values in Old and New Testament of people who serve God is actually hospitality. And hospitality is about giving time, energy, care, sometimes at cost, in welcoming other people into our lives. Not because we expect something back, not like English people. You know, you invite invite someone for dinner because you want to be invited for dinner back. Is that a fair comment? Yeah. Doesn't work quite like that in other cultures, does it, Timmy? No. You, You invite and you've got... You're not inviting in order to get a return invite. And that's true of most cultures in the world, English well. Anyway, we, I won't st- I'll stop knocking English people at the moment. What happens in America? It's the same thing. You invite because you want an invitation back, yeah? 
Yeah. But you see, hospitality in, New, in, in Old and New Testament is about giving and just opening your hearts and your lives and welcoming people and never knowing what the outcome of that is going to be. As one person wrote, one of the writers that I'm going to quote a few times this morning, I call Brown, wrote this, Charity is an investment in joy. Charity is an investment in joy. So let's think for a moment, right at the beginning, before we get into, further into the text, this, this image here of casting your bread upon the waters, of giving portions to seven, yes, to eight. It doesn't literally mean seven or eight. It's, it's a proverbial number. Not knowing what's going to happen. What is, what is that in today's contemporary terms about our life with God as Christians today? What, what are some of the things do you think that might look like for us? What are some of the, the ways that God might be asking you, us, in the imagery here to cast our bread upon the waters? What does it look like? Telling other people about Jesus at appropriate times. Yeah, we had that in the testimony this morning as well, didn't we? Yeah. Telling other people about Jesus. Yeah, what else? Just to be charitable. To, to, uh, yeah, to, to, to be giving to people. Can, can you give me some examples? I want, I want to try and root this in some, some concrete stuff. So, you know, we use the phrase being charitable, but can you just give two or three examples of what that might look like for you, for example? Uh -huh. Well, when uh, you meet a newcomer, invite them home. Uh, yeah. For, for, you know, uh, feed them. Uh, I think it means it's literal, too, in that giving to charities. Um, there's a need for that, and uh, that does a lot of good. Um, so. Yeah, in the way that we were talking this morning about the homeless charity that we've been uh, working with and the, uh, that event last week that raised uh, huge sums of money. And uh, yeah, great. What else? I guess the summary of that for me is to be generous in all that God's given you. So that's your time, your money, and your gifts, being generous with sharing them and using them away from yourself, as it were. Gonna say the similar thing now, using the gifts God has given us to bless others. Give an example. Can can we can we just root it into something really practical? Yeah, like probably interceding for others if need be if God put it in your heart to do that, or um welcoming people in into your home if they if they're stranded, and that's God what God has laid in your heart to do. Okay, great. Any more? Hmm. <laughs> What comes to my mind is that we should, not should, but um, open our lives to people, like not pretend that what they're going through you've never been through. It makes them feel that, oh, at least someone's been there and I can talk to them and know that uh, there is a way out. That's it, really. Great, thank you. I can see your hand, John. I'm not quite worked out how I'm going to get to you. Oh, here we go. I uh, just, I think... Um, we, could, we all do little things here and there to help people, but when you go beyond the point of which someone thinks, crikey, you know, no, no, please stop. Um, even at cost, at sacrifice, you know, you might have had a long day at work and you, you go, no, I'll come and help you out or do this, that and the other. And it's, it's just an, it's a cost, basically. It might be inconvenience in your time or actually uh, a really bad, awkward situation and you, you just give beyond what would normally be expected, I think. Yeah, coming back into my, to my mind is, a, is just an example back from my own life for Leslie and myself. Uh, I won't unpack what happened, but, but something very difficult had happened to us, and we were, um, and particularly to Leslie, and uh, was finding that very, very difficult. And there was a knock at the door, and there was um, the biggest bouquet of flowers that I've ever seen, just there. And a little note, the person's name, just thinking of you. The next day, it's another knock at the door. Another huge bouquet of flowers from the same person. Their name, 
praying for you. The next day, there's another knock at the door, another humongous bouquet of flowers. Just the name, God's with you. And that just meant, in our context and situation, just such a huge amount. It was, you know, to get flowers once was nice, but actually to have the place looking like a flower shop, we could have gone into business, I tell you. But it's, it's just that, you know, that communicates something of God's heart of generosity for us at a time when we were feeling quite low, saying particularly Leslie, quite low, this is my wife, by the way, quite low, and because of what had happened to us. And here, you know, just generosity into that. Uh, way beyond, as, as, as John was saying, way beyond what you might expect. And uh, that's communicating something. So yes, yeah, so casting our bread upon the waters. Let's go on, verse 3. If clouds are full of water, they pour rain upon the earth. Those of you who are sleeping out last Friday night, you know that's true. Clouds are full of water, rain comes upon the earth. When a tree falls to the south or to the north, in the place where it falls, there will it lie. Whoever watches the wind will not plant. Whoever looks at the cloud will not reap. As you do not know the path of the wind or how the body is formed in a mother's womb, so you cannot understand the works of God, the maker of all things. Sow your seed in the morning, and at the evening let not your hands be idle, for you do not know which will succeed, whether this or that, or whether both will do equally well. You know, there are some difficulties that you can anticipate. You can look outside, you can see huge clouds, and in some places even more predictable than others. I, I remember, just come back to my mind now, I remember standing at a, at a funeral, at a graveside. I was in Jamaica, and uh, I'd gone to this funeral, and the lady I was with said to me, Pastor, we need to go inside. And I said, I'd like to stay and watch the rest of the service. I said, no, Pastor, we need to go inside. So I'd like to watch the rest of the service. I said, okay, pastor, I will be in that building over there. And she went. Two minutes later, I, I mean, the word rain for an English person does not do justice to it. I mean, it was, there wasn't a gap between the raindrops, just jump like that. I then went over to the building. No, so it's predictable. It's predictable. Does that resonate with you, Carleen? Yeah. So you can see the clouds and you know it's going to rain. It's predictable. But there are other things that happen that aren't predictable. When I read this verse again this week, I remembered just, I think it was a couple of years ago, just in the park down the road here. Someone was walking into the park and half a tree fell on them and killed them. Utterly unpredictable. I mean, they looked at the tree afterwards because you know, they wanted to sue the council for negligence, but there was no way that could have been predicted. And there are things in life that happen like that. It's just, it just happens. You don't know it's going to happen. It's a part of life. Either way, we can't prevent the difficulties of life. There, actually, we couldn't stop the rain at that graveside, even if we wanted to stay there for the rest of the service. You, know, you just couldn't do that. We can't prevent the difficulties of life. And if we wait, here's the lesson now, if we wait for the perfect circumstances or the perfect situation or a time when we're pretty sure that nothing is going to go wrong, we will never do anything. We'll never even make that decision to do anything. And if we don't do anything, we are guaranteed not to succeed. Shall I say that again? If we don't do something, we're guaranteed not to succeed. We, we think, well, you know, if I do it now, it might fail because, because it might do this, it might do that. Well, the way to guarantee no success is not to do anything. Back to that casting bread image again. Quote Derek Kidner on this verse. If there are risks in everything, 
And there is nothing in life that is risk-free. We like to pretend, particularly in, in Europe, we like to pretend that we can get, you know, do things and generate situations that are risk-free. There is nothing in life that is risk-free. So Derek Kinner says, if there are risks in everything, it's better to fail in launching out than in hugging one's resources to oneself. It's better to fail in launching out than hugging one's resources to oneself knowing that you're not going to succeed because you're not investing. You're not casting your bread. And again, we're not talking about money here. We're talking about things that are far more important and significant than that, things about our lives. You know, we, we cannot know all the answers. So our response, says the writer to Ecclesiastes, should be that we do stuff in the morning and in the evening. Accepting our limited knowledge and not being paralyzed by the fact that we don't know the outcome. There are so many times I, I look back for me again in my walk with God. There are so many times God has asked me to do things and I have got absolutely no idea what the outcome is going to be. But because God's asked me to do it, I've got on and done it. And as we again heard this morning, God doesn't let us down. Even when at times it might feel like that, for a moment, God never, ever lets us down. Be very careful then, wrote Paul to the Ephesians in chapter 5 and verse 15. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise but wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Making the most of every opportunity. Even when there are rain clouds and falling trees and wind. We don't know the path of it. We don't understand stuff. But when God says, we do. So let's think about ourselves again and our own context and situations. What are some of the challenges for us from these verses, from these first six verses we looked at this morning? What are some of the challenges that come to us in the way that we are? Again, if we can give some practical examples, try and root it into everyday life. Can I explain the question a bit more? Yeah, of course I can. We, we've been talking here. What I'm, what I'm, no, we've been talking here about the fact that life is never risk-free, that we never know quite what's going to happen. You might think you know what's going to happen this afternoon. You might be right. You might be completely wrong. Something else may happen that's altogether unexpected, unanticipated. It might be something welcome. It might be something unwelcome. That's how life is. And in, in that context, we need to live a life of faith, which means that we're living stuff not by our human sight, not by what we can predict, not by what we know. And, and he's warning us here about if we try and work it all out, we can be paralyzed by the uncertainty, of not knowing what's going to happen, not knowing how something's going to work out. So my question is, when we think about our lives today, He's obviously writing in a different context, in a different time, thousands of years ago. But when we think about our lives today, what are some of the challenges for us, particularly in the, the culture in which we live? What are some of the challenges for us from this word into our lives today? Does that make that clear? Excellent. What do you think? We were, we were actually discussing this very issue um, in house group on Wednesday night and one of the things that occurs to me is the more that you think you have to risk, the less likely you are to risk it. 
because you've acquired stuff or circumstances around yourself. So, for example, I was saying to my house group on Wednesday night that when I was 20 and God said, quit your job in which you've just been promoted and go and do charity work for a year for nothing, I just said yes. Because I knew God had said it. And so I just thought, that's fine. Because it was basically just about me. I didn't have anything else to think about other than me. Yeah, I knew my mum and dad would freak out and go mad and go, you've just been a really good job, you're an idiot, which they did. But, but I just did it anyway. And I was thinking to myself, well, hold on a minute, now I'm 50. Yes, there are probably things in my heart to do. And I think I'm 50, I still have a large mortgage, I have a wife to support, I have bills to pay, I have stuff going on. So I have a lot more to risk. Therefore, it's much more difficult to risk. But in a strange way, that sense of adventure doesn't leave you. So you're fighting with that tension all the time. Very good. Very helpful. Your hand was that, wasn't it? it? Was, yeah. just, going, just, just going on from what John was saying, I was just thinking right now. I think you said a lot of times we have like a fear or, uh, or, or a doubt in our own minds thinking that if I go do this, if God's calling me to do this and I do it, how's it going to look? Pretty much what John was saying. What am I going to give up? How's it going to look to everyone? Is everyone going to understand? And it's about standing firm in the faith, I think, rather than thinking about what other people are going to think or what's going to happen to you. That's it. Yeah, and what other people might think of you at the same time. Very true. I, for me, I think this particular verse portrays that life is like a thin thread and that if God wants us to be, we be. And if God wants us to give, we give. And if God wants us to do, we do. And giving without seeking reward. Very good. Um, it says, the sacrifice of the Lord is a broken heart or a broken spirit. I think when you humble yourself before God, and he says to you, I want you to do it. Nothing will stop you. You will do it for the Lord. If it means sacrificing mortgage, bills, whatever it is, it means you, you will do it for the Lord. Very good. Very good. Hi, I just wanted to say, um, when you look at our lives today, um, there are companies out there that tell you that we can take your risk for, you know, your phone falling into the water or, you know, breakage or whatever. Same with cars, same with house, house contents, that sort of thing. It's like society is telling you that you don't have to take the risk, but if you pay us, we'll take that risk for you. And it's very um, different to our walk of faith um, you know, we take the risk because we trust in God, not an insurance company or other people who say they can protect us from this, that and the other. So from that perspective, you know, we are going against the grain because we are trusting God rather than companies or people to take the risk for us. That's a very perceptive insight because in our culture today, in, in Europe particularly, we are a very risk averse culture. And uh, which is why we've had some, some extraordinary things that banks are having to give compensation for because it was actually often about a false risk that people were thinking they were insuring against, but actually when you look at the small print, they weren't insuring against anything. They were just paying out money every month. But it, it feeds into that thing in our culture that we shouldn't be risk takers at all, that we should be able to pay somebody to take the risk for us. We should be able to get away from that. And that, that's very much something that's a part of our, our current culture, that everything can be controlled, that everything can be taken, the risk can be taken out. And that is against the life of faith. Because in fact, the life of faith, everything is at risk. And that's the reality. Yeah. Um, when I think about risk, I, I think about sacrifice. Um, if we sacrifice to the Lord something that costs us nothing and has no risk. What good is it? It's not really a sacrifice to the Lord at all. It has to cost us something to be a sacrifice of value. And I guess 
My, my example would be that uh, most precious to me in the world is my family, and I see them maybe once every four years. You know, that's, that's and and could, you, could you, for peop many people on the internet won't know why that is, and many people here won't know why, just in a couple of sentences, could you say why you see them once in four years? Um, we serve the Lord in not just London, but based in London um, with, a, with a ministry and um, with a missions ministry. And we do a four-year rotation, four years here, and then we get to go back and see our family, and then we come back and do it all over again. So it's because you're, God has called you to serve here in, in Europe, as, as I say, not just in London, but elsewhere also. That, so that is a cost for you. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Mm. Verse 7, chapter 11. Life is sweet, and it pleases the eyes to see the sun. However many years a man may live, let him enjoy them all. But let him remember the days of darkness, for they will be many. Everything to come is meaningless. Be happy, young man, while you are young. And let your heart give you joy in the days of your youth. Follow the ways of your heart and whatever your eyes see. But know that for all these things, God will bring you to judgment. So then banish anxiety from your heart. Cast off the troubles of your body. For youth and vigor are meaningless. God wants everyone who's living a life of faith to enjoy life. Jesus came so that we can have life and have it abundantly. To see the sun here is, is to bask in its warmth and its joy and all that life offers. So we should enjoy life. Whatever stage we're at, young, middle-aged, not quite so young, wherever you categorize yourself, we should enjoy life, but enjoy it with eyes open to the reality of life. Because the fact is that there will be in our lives days of darkness and sorrow. It goes with the territory of being alive. I, I can't remember the context, but I was reading uh, an exchange between two people recorded in, in a book. I've got it, yeah. And um, the, the, the writer of the book, uh, his wife was dying. And... He was complaining about the pain of loss. And she said to him, and he wrote it in the book, that's the cost of life, love and joy. Very profound comment. So in our life, there will be times of darkness and sorrow. All of us will experience the pain of bereavement, for example. At some stage. It happens in life. And all of us will die ourselves at some stage, unless Jesus comes first. But all of us will die ourselves. And all of us, even if Jesus comes first, will be judged for the way that we have lived our lives. Amen? Amen. Ah, that wasn't a very loud amen. So our lives need to be lived with one eye on our ultimate destination. Now, let me go back. God wants those who are living a life of faith to enjoy life, life abundant. So the context of thinking about death and judgment shouldn't rob us of joy. Here's an interesting quote from Derek Kidner. Joy, listen to this, joy was created 
to dance with goodness and not alone. Do you like that? Joy was created to dance with goodness and not alone. We sometimes think, and again, our society here in the West, in, in Europe, its essence, it's somewhat hedonistic. It, it thinks that we can have all sorts of joy without any price or cost attached to that. And it's about doing what feels good for us, for ourselves. Joy was created to dance with goodness and not alone. And as we, to quote Brown again, we, we experience that joy. It enables one, he says, to age graciously and to accept without resentment all that life offers, both good and and bad. Let's think about that process of, of getting older. It's something which, again, our society, we reflected on this a lot, our society here likes to try and pretend that death isn't going to happen. Remember, I got you turning to one another a few times ago saying, I'm going to die, and so are you, which you, some of you found a bit strange. And, and the fact you found it so strange, as we reflected on the time, is because our society tries to deny the reality of that. And we talked about that a lot previously, and I won't go back over that now. But there's so much that is sold in our society to try and create the illusion that you're not actually aging. I'm pretty sure I saw an advert the other day for an, um, I think it was described as an age-defying cream. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's what it said. <laughs> Say again? <laughs> he was asking, was that why I was in boots? But there's a lot in our, in our culture about that, isn't that? It's, it's just denying the, that, that reality that is there. But if we accept life with joy, and we enjoy life in its fullness, what does living like that look like for us today? How does that contrast with the life that those, in the words of the writer here, living under the sun, living without knowledge and reference to God? What is different for us as Christians as we deal with those difficulties, with those dark and sorrow-filled days, with that process of aging that is there for us, which as you get a bit older, you're more aware of than when you're younger, says he who's getting a bit older. What is that contrast? What does it look like in practice for us in the way that, that we live our lives in, in relationship to God, in contrast to people who are living, as the writer here calls it, under the sun without any reference to God? Think about that for a moment. That was close. Um, I think if you're living life um, under the sun, you know, without um, hope in God and um, a future, a good future after this life, um, like as you get older, then it seems just to be more futile as you go along. But when you're getting older um, and you know Jesus, like the end is sort of, better than the beginning because like you're nearer to you know you have that hope and as much as you don't want it to come too soon because you love the people around you you know it's not futile there's a future and it's better than the present 
Amen. Anybody else? Society without God would tell us as we get older, we lose our value. Uh, we have less to offer. We you know, try not to give jobs, all sorts of ways that we lose our value. As a Christian, we don't. We retain our value. We have as much value in God's sight when we're 99 as when we were nine. And God, we, and God has... Um, he has things for us. He has a life for us. Some people, you know, again, society would say kind of like retire and that's the end. But no, God says, I've got a new life for you, a different life, but it's life to the full. Very good. Anybody else? Okay, let's go into chapter 12 now. I'm going to read chapter 12 from a different version because the NIV is really not very helpful. And it, it, is, a, it is an accurate translation, but it, in the sense that it conveys the meaning of the words, but it doesn't actually uh, really get to the heart of what's being said. Uh, let me illustrate this. We, in, in English, we have an expression. We talk about it's raining cats and dogs. Familiar with that expression? Okay, if you translated that into Yoruba, and um, you were in Nigeria, and in one of those storms I've experienced in Nigeria, and you said in Yoruba, it's raining cats and dogs. What would be the, res the response from the people around that you said that to in Yoruba? It's lost it. <laughs> They'd say you're barking mad with the cats and dogs. And, and there are so many things like that in languages. Um, I, what's the, is there an equivalent expression that you can translate to English? I know in Portuguese... In Portuguese, they say it's raining knives. Who will know? Belinda. Belinda. What's the equivalent expression if you translate it into English? Can you know? You don't know. It's very disappointing. <laughs> but you, 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 get, you get the image here. And, and the first part of chapter, two, um, of chapter 12 is full of these sorts of images. So, you, for example, it, it talks about a, a person with almond blossom. Yeah, grey hair. You know, and, and it, there, there are a whole load of, of those expressions there that, that actually really don't, um, you know, when the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men stoop, when the grinders cease because there are few and those looking through the windows grow dim, you think, what's that about? Well, actually, these are all images about, about life and about aging. So I'm going to read to you from the message version, which has um, taken those uh, images and put them into contemporary North American, um, which works most of the time in English, though... The message version, when it describes Jesus as being a lush, I think that doesn't quite work in English. It's the word that in the authorised version is a wine bibber. But in the message version becomes a lush, and I had to look up and think, what does that mean? So, here we go. Uh, so this is from, this is verses um, 1 to 8 of chapter 12, and I'm reading from the message version this time. Honour and enjoy your creator while you're still young. Before the years take their toll and your vigour wanes. Before your vision dims and the world blurs. And the winter years keep you close to the fire. In old age, your body no longer serves you so well. Muscles slacken. Grip weakens. Joints stiffen. The shades are pulled down on the world. You can't come and go at will. Things grind to a halt. The hum of the household fades away. But you awaken now by birdsong. Hikes to the mountains are a thing of the past. Even a stroll down the road has its terrors. Your hair turns apple blossom white. Adorning a fragile 
and impotent matchstick body. He pulls no punches, does he? (laughs) Yes, you're well on the way to eternal rest. (laughs) While your friends make plans for your funeral, life, lovely while it lasts, is soon over. Life as we know it, precious and beautiful ends. The body is put back in the same ground it came from. The spirit returns to God who first breathed it. This is the only time in the whole of this book that the author talks about the creator and actually uses the term creator. That's because he's working towards his conclusion. It reminds us that God made us. God made you. God made you. God knows every single thing about you. Because he made you. Even before you were in the world outside of your mother's body, he was putting you together. He made you. These verses that we've read here, they give a very graphic image of aging with a decline of physical and mental powers. I still remember not long after I'd started here, I was visiting one of our older church members, used to live just across the road. I remember her leaning forward and saying to me, Pastor, she said, don't ever get old. (laughs) Knew what she meant. We're all on a journey, on a journey to our eternal destiny. Under the sun, the verse I didn't read, verse 8, it's all smoke, nothing but smoke. The quester says that everything is smoke. Under the sun, all of this is meaningless. But the challenge for us is to respond to our Creator. To quote Brown Brown for the last time, the eternal sleep of death serves as a wake-up call to live. The eternal sleep of death serves as a wake-up call to live. Death is an unavoidable and natural part of life. I still vividly remember, and I was reading this again, this passage again this week, I still vividly remember the first funeral I went to outside of the UK. It was actually in South Africa, in a black township. And uh, it was an elderly lady who died of old age. And uh, it was a, funerals there were quite long. We, we arrived... Um, about eight hours after it had started, and we stayed there all day, and we left some time before it was finished. And they talked about this lady at this funeral. She was quite cantankerous in her old age. She was quite a difficult lady, quite clearly, but had a real faith in God. Do you know there were over one thousand people at that funeral everybody in the community came to celebrate her life and here was the thing that I noticed because I'd taken lots of funerals in the UK and usually when you have a funeral of a very elderly person uh, I've taken them with two people present but here the whole community came And I noticed that that their attitude to death was so different from what I experienced here because it was celebrated as being a part of life. It, It was not seen any differently from just the rest of life. It was normal. It was natural. And it was okay. But the whole community came together just to celebrate this very 
ordinary. She wasn't special. She hadn't done anything amazing in life. She wasn't married to anybody famous. She was just an ordinary elderly person who died. Over a thousand people there at her funeral. And it's this recognition that death is a normal, healthy, and I use that word deliberately, part of life. And as we keep that, it helps us to live a life with God, remembering him. Remembering him in the sense that all that we do is in the context of him. And that can lead to living a life that's full of meaning and significance. You know, true meaning and significance is not about how much physical stuff we can accumulate. It's not about how many followers we have on Twitter. How many people read our post on Facebook. How well known we are or not. How clever we are. It's none of that at all. It is about how we've lived our life before God. That's what really matters. Because that's what gives our life significance and meaning. Outside of that, life is, frankly, meaningless. It's just smoke. But with God, you can have meaning and significance. His final few verses. And these final few verses were probably not written by the same writer that wrote the rest of the book. It's a conclusion that has been added from someone else in the, uh, in the wisdom school has written. The, uh, I won't bother explaining the reasons for that, but it's almost certainly the case. And uh, so the conclusion is this. Not only was the teacher wise, but he imparted knowledge to the people. He pondered and searched out and set in order many proverbs. The teacher searched to find just the right words, and what he wrote was upright and true. The words of the wise are like goads. I'll come back to that in a moment. They're collected sayings like firmly embedded nails, given by one shepherd. Be warned, my son of anything in addition to them. Of the making of many books, there is no end. And much study wearies the body. Is that true, Warren? <laughs> now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. Goads, it's not a word we use very much in English, it's a pointed stick, a large pointed stick. And it was used to guide animals. So now you're shifting the cattle, so big pointy stick, just to help them go in the right direction. The words of the wise that we've been reading, the writer says, are like a large pointed stick to prod you. Do you like being prodded by large pointed sticks? But does it help you to go in the right direction when God's holding the stick? Mm. The words of the wise should stimulate action. That's the whole point of the pointy stick is to stimulate some action on the part of the animal that you're herding. It speaks of a relationship. This phrase, fear God and keep his commands, speaks of a relationship to our creator who wants the very best for us. So, to sum up this section from today, and uh, our time's nearly gone, I'm going to pray for us in a moment. Life is unpredictable. Key things take away from that. Life is unpredictable. It does involve difficult times. But if we trust God, life can be enriching, meaningful, and full of joy.
We should be aware, live aware of our mortality and enjoy life to the full. Let's stand together. Let me pray for you as we finish. I'm going to give you a few moments of quiet. There may be something that you want to say to God yourself. and Then I'm going to lead us in prayer. Father God, we want to thank you for this writer who wrote this book that we know as Ecclesiastes. Thank you for his penetrating insights, his tough questioning, his ruthless exposure of life and what life is about. Father, thank you that you want us to have life in its fullness. And thank you that as the writer has punctured the myths, the false hopes that are around in society, it's brought us face to face with true joy true meaning, true significance. Father, help us to be people who live our lives to the full, enjoying abundant life and abundant joy as we serve you. In Jesus' name, amen. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.